Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, so I'm going to try to give an impression of a small part of what I've been calling LP operator algebras. Uh, uh, for the most part, stuff that's been done is the isometric theory. Uh, much less is known about isomorphic theory. We only look at them up to isomorphism. Uh, uh, and selected, I've made a small selection material and have taken that further away from C star algebra methods. Uh, uh, I should tell you that I'm mainly a C star algebraist, um, and a lot of what I did here was uh, motivated by known examples in C star algebras. So here's a rough outline, some motivation from C star algebras, uh, just a definition of LP operator algebras. Lamperti's theorem and, and something about how it's used. Uh, and then I'm going to talk mainly, the main example I'll talk about is LP Kuntz algebras, and I'll say two different things about them. One is uh, uniqueness, that when you specify the things, you always get the same algebra. Uh, and the second is that uh, if you choose P wrong, you can't represent the algebra on, uh, uh, on the a different LP space. Scalars are complex numbers. Uh, that's standard in Banach algebras for reasons of spectrum and functional calculus. Uh, algebras will be unital here. Um, isomorphisms are usually isometric, but in the last section they need not be. Uh, and they're supposed to be bijective. <clears throat> so I'll assume that P is strictly between one and infinity and usually not two. Uh, some things are still true if P is one. Essentially, nothing is known uh, if P is infinity. Uh, it's not even clear that one should represent an L infinity, maybe on C of X. Uh, proofs for P equals two often don't work, uh, or P not equals two, and the other way around. Sometimes the proofs really have to be different in, in both cases. Uh, by the way, stop me if I'm going too fast or, uh, Anything like that? Okay, so there's enormous literature on C star algebras, more than on all other kinds of Banach algebras put together. I once looked in math reviews, uh, the lengths of the reviews on, I think it's 46L by comparison with the other categories which have Banach algebras. Uh, there are also very powerful theorems in the area. C star algebra has a lot of structure, a lot more than one might think just from its axioms. Uh, and I'll just mention here the Elliott classification program, uh, which says basically that simple, separable, and usual C star algebras, which are sufficiently nice, uh, and here are words saying what, what that is, uh, are determined up to isometric isomorphism by uh, al essentially algebraic topological invariance, uh, which is really K theory, uh, and their traces. So it's, it's really very striking. You take two of these algebras, you compute these invariants. If the invariants are the same, the algebras are isomorphic. Um, I'll mention K-theory a, K a few times during the talk. If you've not heard of it, don't worry. It's not essential. Um, but for those that have seen it, I want to at least uh, 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 put it sort of in the uh, right place in the discussion. So LP operator algebras don't have anywhere near as much structure, but they turn out to have rather more than one might at first have guessed. Um, and uh, so the, the theory is therefore much more recent. Um, so we don't actually know, as, I'll, as I've written on a slide in a little bit, we don't actually know what a C star like LP operator algebra should be. Uh, we have some examples. Uh, and the examples are motivated by standard examples of standard old examples of C star algebras. Uh, this is not a complete list of the ones for which people have uh, found analogs of LP operator on LP, but it's uh, still sort of the basic list. Um, the main one in the actual talk today will be the LP analogs of Kuntz algebras, uh, which are fairly far down in the list. They're on the next slide. Um, and AF algebras will put in a brief appearance. There, there's a lot more. Uh, so here's the obvious C star algebra, just bounded operators on a Hilbert space, including a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Every C star algebra is itself a joint subalgebra of one of these. C 
of x, continuous functions on x with complex values for a compact house source space x. Remember, assuming things are unital. Um, every commutative unital c strand algebra is isomorphic to one of these. I didn't actually write it, but uh, uh, if you know the algebra, you recover x and you get the same maps between the algebras and the spaces. And so this leads to uh, c strand algebras being thought of as non commutative compact house door spaces. I'll write down misprints as, uh, as I catch them. In this case, it's just a missing pause. Uh, finite dimensional C star algebras. Uh, these are basically direct sums of various finite dimensional matrix algebras. Uh, I excluded the zero algebra here. Uh, the norm on the direct sum is the soup of the uh, norms of the entries. Uh, algebras of triangular matrices are not self adjoint and therefore not C star algebras. Toplitz algebra generated by the, the C star algebra of the unilateral shift by say Bonnach algebra have also have to explicitly put in the adjoint. For a discrete group, there's a reduced C star algebra of, of the group, uh, which is gotten by taking the regular representation on little l2 of the group by the translation operators, which are unitary, and taking their closed linear span. Uh, there's also a full C star algebra. And there's a more complicated definition for locally compact group, which I won't say anything about. Uh, but all of these things have LP analogs. Um, so here's just a list of the examples we saw. Uh, irrational rotation algebras, these are a special case of a more general construction, which I won't talk about, uh, but they were among the early examples. Uh, take an irrational number alpha, uh, choose a Hilbert space, and unitaries on it, such that v u is e to the 2 pi i alpha times u v. So they commute up to the scalar factor, which is basically an irrational angle. And take the C star, C star algebra degenerate. So a theorem, this algebra is simple, and up to, we call it isometric isomorphism, it's independent of the choice of u and v. AF algebras. So here's one definition. The C star algebra is AF if basically finite sets can be approximated by finite dimensional subalgebras. So for every finite subset and epsilon bigger than zero, I can find a finite uh, dimensional subalgebra which uh, contains, which epsilon contains my finite set. Theorem, it's equivalent to say that A is a countable direct limit of finite dimensional C star algebras. Won't prove this. Uh, Kuhn's algebras. So again, like for irrational rotation algebras, choose a Hilbert space. And now we're going to choose isometries on it. So isometry is the condition that sj star sj is 1. And they have orthogonal ranges which add up to 1. Or, well, which add up to the whole space. So the, so the sj sj star are the projections on the ranges, projection, orthogonal projection here. Uh, and they're supposed to add up to 1. And I take the C star algebra generated by all these things. So I take basically all words in these things and their adjoints and take the closed linear span. Theorem, it's purely infinite and simple. I've got a definition of purely infinite in a moment. Uh, and again, up to isomorphism, it's independent of the choice of the generating isometries, right? Choose any Hilbert space, any uh, S1 up to SD satisfying these conditions, you always get the same algebra. Simple unital ring, this, this definition makes sense very generally, uh, is purely infinite if whenever you take a non-zero element, uh, you can multiply it by both sides uh, on suitable things and get one. Right? Contrast what happens if you take the n by n matrices and a is a rank one operator, then x a y is also rank one. So it can't possibly equal one. 
On the other hand, the Kalkin algebra on a Hilbert space uh, is one of these things. Okay, just to put things further in context, um, uh, I want to briefly say more about the Elliott classification program. So, unital C string algebra you think of as a non commutative version of continuous functions on a compact host or space. Some algebraic topology generalizes from spaces and thus commutative algebras to not necessarily commutative algebras. K theory actually makes sense for general Banach algebras. Um, the original theorem in the program is Elliott's uh, classification. Uh, by now, what is it, uh, uh, roughly, uh, what, uh, 45 years ago, um, of AF algebras. These are the ones which are approximate, which are limits of finite dimensional algebras. So let A and B AF algebras take the K0 groups, which I've not defined, with additional structure as scaled order to Belian groups, which I've also not defined. And, uh, Suppose these are isomorphic, then the algebras are isomorphic. So this means an isometric star isomorphism of algebras. So it, it, it's really very striking. You take uh, a kind of algebraic topological invariant, and if it's the same on two things, then your things are isomorphic. And the Elliott program has since gone far beyond this uh, but I'm not going to say anything about what the, the words in the other um, slide meant. Uh, questions? Okay, so an LP operator algebra is a bonding algebra which is isometrically isomorphic to a closed sub algebra of the bounded operators on an LP space. All I've done is replace L2 with LP. Well, okay, except I would get an L2 operator algebra, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So here I'm going to assume they are separable, and in this case, you can assume that the measure space is sigma finite and, the, and its LP space is separable. You have to actually prove that, but... Uh, uh, and for, from now on, I'm going to assume that all of the time. Um, I explicitly said it sometimes anyway, but that's the, the basic assumption. So not, if I take P equals two, I get things which are not necessarily self-adjoint and therefore need not be C star algebras. For example, upper triangular matrices. And without an adjoint, we do not know the right definition of a C star like LP operator algebra. And in fact, uh, figuring out what this uh, right definition should be is a major problem in the area. Uh, we know examples which are well or somewhat well C star like, but we don't have, well, there may be several definitions depending on different degrees of this, but we just don't know. Just an example, C of X is an LP operator algebra. We represent it as multiplication operators on uh, LP of X mu for some measure mu. And the D by D matrices with the norm that they get as acting on a little LP of D points is obviously an LP operator algebra. And it's the analog of just the D by D matrices uh, uh, which when I get with P equals two uh, as a C star algebra. And then spatial LPAF algebras are by definition direct limits of direct sums of these things. And I'll mention one thing that Elliott's AF classification works for, for a spatial LPAF algebras. This is joint work with Maria Grazia Viola. Uh, uh, on the other hand, still things go wrong. Um, the LP operator algebras of finite groups turn out not to be spatial. <laughs> so they are sort of C star like, but not that C star like, it seems. Uh, 
so again, this, this touches on, on the uh, uh, issue of what the right definition should be. So I wanted to find spatial idempotence and partial isometries. I, I'm not really going to say why I called the other things spatial LPAF algebras. So an idempotent and a Banach unital Banach algebra is spatial. Um, if, well, I take E and 1 minus E and I take the linear combinations of those, this gives me a map from C direct sum C as a Banach algebra. Uh, and I norm that using the max norm. Uh, and this map is supposed to be contractive. Uh, then a spatial partial isometry is uh, something which is supposed to be made to look like a partial isometry uh, on a Hilbert space. So there should be T, which plays the role of S star, uh, and there should be spatial idempotence E and F, such that uh, basically TS is one of them, ST is the other, and there aren't any extraneous pieces, which is why I also want to assume F, S, E is S, and e, F, e, T, F is T. Uh, uh, and then S and T are supposed to have norm at most one. So on a Hilbert space, special isometries are projections and that is self-adjoint idempotence. Uh, even on LP, uh, if you just assume that norm E and norm one minus E are less than or equal to one, this does not imply that the thing is spatial, not even uh, on LP of two points. <laughs> and S in this definition is a partial isometry and T is necessarily equal to S star. So on LP, and here P had better not be equal to two, you can characterize these things using Lamperti's theorem. So here I've just reproduced the, the definitions. Uh, so Lamperti characterized uh, the isometries from uh, LP spaces, well, they should be on sigma finite measures, uh, and they're not necess necessarily assumed to be surjective. So they're just isometric linear maps from uh, LP of one space to LP of something else. Um, and you can identify uh, the spatial idempotence and spatial partial isometries uh, in LP uh, on LP of X mu uh, using this. Uh, and so what you get, I'll, I'll put a statement, a rough statement of Lamperti's theorem in a bit, uh, but what you get is that spatial idempotents are exactly multiplication operators by characteristic functions of measurable sets. And now, uh, if with the spatial partial isometry, I assume that the, I have chosen, or uh, named the measurable sets associated with the spatial idempotents which appeared, then S is almost something like this, uh, there's a measure class preserving bijection from F to E and a measurable function uh, on F, which is, has absolute value one almost everywhere, uh, such that my isometry is gotten by uh, taking a function on E, composing it with this H, uh, and then putting in a correction factor uh, of a radon nicotine derivative due to the fact that I only preserve the measure class, not the measure, and then multiplying by this function of absolute value one. Okay, as far as is known, it's not quite true. You seem to have to allow a suitable no version of isomorphism of sigma algebras in place of the map H. Uh, I don't, as far as I know, there are no examples known where to show this is really needed, but uh, there's also no theorem known. Okay, so here I've put back Lamperti's theorem, uh, or at least this slightly, uh, 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 almost version of it. You can look at what the isometries are in the complex, in, in the D by D matrices, and there are not very many of them. They're just the complex permutation matrices. Take a permutation matrix and replace the uh, ones by, scalars of absolute value one. And the spatial partial isometries, well, you take one of these things and you replace some of the ones by zeros and then you replace the rest of them by uh, complex numbers of absolute value one. And there are many fewer of them than there are partial isometries in a C-star algebra. 
And just as a contrast here, you know, usual C strand algebra, every element is a linear combination of four unitaries, and that's certainly not true, even in the D by D matrices uh, with the LP operator norm. You can use Lamparty's theorem to characterize contractive unital representations uh, of the D by D matrices. And what you basically get is that the representation comes from a partition of the underlying measure space. And again, uh, using the approximation that I've got almost from measure class preserving isomorphisms uh, between the pieces of this partition, uh, which give you where the matrix units go. Uh, and it's not hard to see that when you have this structure, then this row has to be isometric. So contractive implies isometric. OK, here are the Kuntz algebras. Uh, choose a sigma finite measure space and spatial isometries. Uh, so the relations are basically going to be the same. Uh, uh, I don't have adjoints, so I'll use the reverses instead. Uh, on LP, at least they're unique. Um, I said isometry rather than partial isometry. I'm assuming that the uh, initial projection is the identity. Uh, so TJ, SJ is one. Uh, the SJ, TJ are orthogonal idempotent, so the product of any two distinct ones is zero, and they add up to one. Um, these things exist even on little LP. Uh, I won't write an example. And then take uh, the LP Kuntz algebra to be the Banach algebra generated by these things. So theorem up to isomorphism, isometric isomorphism, it's independent of the choice. And theorem, like in the C-star algebra situation, it's purely infinite and simple. So the C-star version, uh, these theorems are really basically one theorem. Uh, you prove the second theorem for any choice of these things. I'll say it a little bit more detail in the next slide. Uh, uh, by using the semi-algebra gotten as the closed linear span of all of the words that I've written there. And the key point about that word is that the number of S's is the same as the number of T's. So that's a special subalgebra. algebra uh, You don't need to worry about words where you have T's before S's. Those are either zero or else the, the product involved is one. Uh, so those are ones are irrelevant. Um, but, the, but these ones are special about the length. Um, and in the C star algebra case, of course, TK is SJ star, SK star. Uh, this algebra turns out to be a simple AF algebra. I won't say how you prove this uh, or how you use it, but, uh, but at any rate, the same proof works in the LP case to prove that the algebra is purely infinite and simple. Uh, so what I'm going to say is, is how one gets from that uh, to the uh, first theorem. Uh, that's what's on the next slide. Uh, and I can't do that on the, in the LP situation. So a brief interlude. <laughs> OK. So here I've put back the theorems, slightly condensed, and I've also put back the relations. In the C-star algebra case, if you've got the second one, here's how you prove the first. So I'll take, let OD be the universal algebra. So in some sense, the biggest one, uh, there's a map from it to any other. So I apply the second theorem to it. It's simple. Since it's universal, for any other algebra B given by the generators, the same generators and relations, there is a star homomorphism from the universal algebra to B. It has dense range because the range contains all the generators, and it is injective since the domain is simple. But in C-strand algebras, injective star homomorphisms are isometric. So the range is closed, and you have an isometric isomorphism. 
And as far as we know, the last step fails for LP operator algebras, although I don't actually, I still don't actually know an example. And probably even ones de deserving to be C star like. I, I actually, uh, for, without the C star like uh, condition, I certainly do know examples. Um, but for the C star like condition, I think there surely must be some, but I don't know of any. Uh, so the first theorem, uh, this is unfortunate. Uh, so what's missing down here is uh, it requires an entirely different proof. And I'm going to try to tell you, uh, uh, something about how one proves this and something about the, um, the, the uh, non-representability on the wrong space. So that's what the rest of the talk will actually be. And this is right, this is where I can't use C star methods. So the, the first theorem is basically I refer to as a uniqueness theorem. Uh, once you've got the right generators and relations, the norm is uniquely determined. I'm going to talk about representations of the underlying purely algebraic object, which is a Levin algebra. Uh, here's its definition. Uh, it's called L sub D. Uh, it was introduced uh, by Levitt uh, for purely algebraic reasons and with the field of scalars being Z mod 2Z, obviously not suitable for a Banach algebra uh, in when was it the 60s, uh, maybe even earlier. Uh, so here are relations. Uh, since I'm writing purely algebraic relations, I got to make sure I actually get everything in there. Um, the second one is what you need to say that the uh, the ranges of the isometry, intended isometries are orthogonal to each other. The product of any two of those idempotents is zero. And here's the condition that the sum is equal to one. Right, in a C-star algebra situation, you write down some of these stuff with T equals, Tj is Sj star. And the relation two actually follows from the other ones in that case. Uh, but that's not true algebraically. Uh, in the purely algebraic situation, uh, uh, you can get ridiculous things happening in characteristic not zero. But. Okay, so I've put back the relations. A representation of the Banach space is just an unusual algebra homomorphism to the bounded uppers in that Banach space. And since the algebra is given by generators and relations, it just means that I find some elements, some bounded operators on that Banach space, which satisfy the relations at the top of the slide. And then when I originally defined uh, the LP Kuntz algebra, I said the SJ were supposed to be spatial isometries. And so I'm gonna call the representation, representation spatial, if that's what it does. Uh, and I really don't need partial there. That should be a spatial isometry, but that's sort of automatic given the relations. Uh, and the uniqueness is the same as this. If I take any two spatial representations and I look at A in the algebraic object, look at its image under these two representations, uh, those images have the same norm as operators, right? You then get the, the same algebras because of an isometric isomorphism from a dense subalgebra of one to a dense subalgebra of the other. So there are two parts. I'm gonna say a little bit about the easier part and very little about the, the messier part. And there are definitions which go into them. So I'm gonna call representation free if the following strange looking thing happens. I can partition the underlying measure space in such a way that when I look at what the images of the asymmetries do, they take something, everything in the mth piece and put it to the m plus first piece. And then the reverses of them have to go backwards. Uh, I don't know, 
free was just a guess as to what sort of word to use here. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a condition like this before, but that's what I need. So basically what it says is that the images of the isometries and the reverses move the parts of this space away from each other. Then there's a proposition. Suppose I take two spatial representations and LP spaces with sigma finite measures, and one of them is free, then the norm you get on that one is less than or equal to the norm you get on the other one. So in particular, for any two free representations, free spatial representations, you get exactly the same Banach algebra up to isometric isomorphism. And for its norm is less than or equal to the norm on what you get for any spatial representation. Here's the other piece. Suppose I take any spatial representation. Well, for the moment, I'll just say representation. This is just algebraic. It's not an LP space. I take the bilateral shift in little LP of the integers. Then I can make a new representation on now the LP space gotten by the LP tensor product of those two things. So it's really the LP direct sum of a bunch of copies of, of LP of X mu. And I'm going to tensor the image of one of my isometries with the bilateral shift and the image of the reverse with uh, the inverse of the bilateral shift. And it turns out you get a representation this way. It's easy to check. I wrote that explicitly in the next slide, but didn't actually do it. Um, and so the lemma is that if, if your original row is spatial, then this row tilde is spatial and free. And then the, the, the other thing is that if row is spatial, then when I replace row by this row tilde, the norm can't get any less. So it's not claiming that if I take, uh, th that I get the row tilde as a representation of the closure of the image of row. This is why I switched representations of the algebraic object so I wouldn't get in trouble at this point. So now I want to recall that the algebra gotten from a free spatial representation is the smallest norm. But here I found a free spatial representation where the norm is bigger than or equal to uh, the uh, given the norm on an arbitrary given spatial representation. And so this actually shows that now all the norms of the spatial representations are the same and proves the uniqueness theorem. Okay, so I'm gonna say a little bit about the proofs of these pieces, amplification first. Uh, so here's again a formula for the representation rho tilde. Uh, P is fixed. Rho, so I'm fixing rho also. Uh, the fact that this is a representation is just algebra. And it's easy to do. Right, and for example, I take rho of tilde of tj times rho tilde of sj and I end up with uh, u inverse times u, and so I get something rather tensored with one. And now how to prove that if rho is spatial, then uh, rho tilde is spatial and free. Well, spatial is uh, relatively easy. I won't do that. I uh, won't say anything about it. Uh, for freeness, well, uh, unfortunately I didn't reproduce the definition here. There wasn't room. But remember, you're supposed to be able to partition the space. Uh, well, oh, sorry, sorry. So, so here, it, ah, mistaking thing. So here, here is just the definition of freeness. So there's supposed to be a partition of the space, such that the SJ move things one way in the partition, the TJ move things the other way in the partition. Okay, 
here's the partition for the amplification. Take X cross just one of the points in Z. Right, that clearly with those using the definitions in the lemma up above, this clearly satisfies that condition. So now I want to prove that the norm can't get any smaller. And here's a, a sketch of the proof. Take something in this algebra LD. It's a finite linear combination of words in the generators. And each of those words moves things. So each of the generators moves things one step or up or down in the family for the partition. So I'm looking at a purely algebraic thing. This is a finite linear combination. Uh, the word, and finally many words are used and they all have finite length. So there's a longest word that's used. I will choose some C in LP of X mu, which is, has norm one and gives close to the correct norm for row of A. I will choose some integer much bigger than the length of this longest word. Then I will pick eta in uh, this tensor product space, which I'm now going to think of as LP as sequences, LP sequences on the integers with values in LP of X mu. I'm going to take it to be zero when absolute, the absolute value of the index is bigger than N. And I'll take it to be C multiplied by some normaliza normalization factor uh, when uh, in the range from minus capital N to capital N. So then the normalization factor is chosen to make norm A to equal one. And then when I look at rho tilde of A applied to um, eta, well, uh, if I'm not close to the end of the interval minus n to n, then, and I take the, the C in some position, then uh, I still get rho of A applied to C, just in slightly different positions. But now if I went, if I took C, which was a little, which was uh, a little bit before, let's say, uh, if needed, and I applied uh, this row tilde of A to it, then it's moved into the position I'm looking at. And so you can check that, uh, except for the entries near the end of the range from minus N to N, the entries in the sequence, row tilde of A applied to eta, are just row, row of A applied to C. Uh, and again, times the same normalization factor. Okay, but that's most of them. So I can go, go down from epsilon over two to epsilon, but I'll still have almost the right norm. So, I take, so what it's saying is when I take this representation and spread out like that, then the norm can't get any smaller. I didn't write it here, but this is taken from uh, ideas involved with amenable groups. Uh, the, the interval minus n to n is a Fulner set for any people who have seen that kind of thing. Um, so, so yes, the idea really somehow did come from C-star algebras, but it's not, certainly not used in, in, in the way a C-star algebraist might use it. Okay, so now I wanna go back to um, proving, saying something about how free representations uh, uh, actually have smaller norm. And I'm going to be, the, the actual proof took, uh, uh, six pages of messing around. Um, I've got the, the definition of freeness written again here. And I've got the statement that a free representation gives you smaller norm than any other representation. So it's going, the very basic ideas are going to end at the bottom of this slide. Um, so first using Lamperti's theorem, um, uh, which is really absolutely crucial here, uh, I'm going to rewrite everything in terms of 
uh, instead of uh, maps from uh, LP of X mu to LP of subspaces and so on, I'm going to write everything in terms of just set transformations of subsets of X and Y. So Lamparty's theorem is absolutely fundamental to what uh, uh, I'm to, to this argument. So very roughly, freeness gives enough flexibility that I can take a finite piece of this set X, again, with the set transformations corresponding to the isometries and their inverses, their reverses, rather, um, and reproduce that piece inside Y. Uh, that's not really quite correct. Um, I have one correction to it at the bottom of the slide, um, but well, let me pass on that for the moment. Um, so now if I look at the norm of rho of A, I can approximate it from below by looking at something support on a finite piece of X. Uh, and then I can find that thing inside Y. So the norm of phi of, of A uh, can't be any smaller. Okay, so one really needs to replace phi with this other representation, which has the same norm. I'm gonna take one tensor phi of A P of A on LP of X cross Y. Uh, the point being that X might've been very large and Y might be a little LP space. So I'm not gonna be able to find uh, uh, pieces of X inside Y, um, but replacing Y by X cross Y doesn't change the norm uh, of phi and makes uh, space to accommodate the sort of excess bulk of X in the irrelevant directions. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about uniqueness. Uh, questions? Okay, so now I wanna talk about non-isomorphism non for different values of P. Um, so first of all, uh, let's, let's talk about the case when D1 is not equal to D2, uh, but P1 and P2 can be arbitrary. So then it turns out these algebras are not isomorphic. Doesn't matter whether P1 is equal to P2 or not. If they have different numbers of generators, they're not isomorphic. Uh, they're not even isomorphic if you completely ignore both the topology and the scalar multiplication and consider them only as rings. Here's the reason. You compute the K0 groups of these things and they're different. In the K0 group, right, they, they are Z mod D minus one Z and Z mod D minus two Z. And the K0 group depends only on the ring structure. So you have to actually compute these things. It uses several c strand algebra ideas and required lots of work to adapt all of them to the LP case. And I'm not going to say anything about that, uh, at least not in the talk. Uh, so now I'm going to go to the case uh, P1 not equal to P2. And uh, of course, it's only interesting here if D1 is equal to D2, but in fact, the that plays no role in the arguments. And this is a question which does not arise in C-star algebras. So here's the theorem. Distinct P1 and P2, and that's, uh, that should be interval one to infinity, not zero to infinity. Uh, I got zero to infinity by mistake in some places because, well, actually sh should certainly not even be closed at zero, uh, but Lamperti's theorem actually works in the, for P strictly between zero and infinity except, between, except P equals two, despite the lack of local convexity. Uh, should I be looking at the, uh, oh. Oh, there are chat. Sorry, difference made when in the decomposition. Sorry, I don't quite understand the question. <laughs> oh, I wasn't, uh, yes, I wasn't watching the chat and I just looked at it. Uh, 
we can get back to it after the talk. If you okay, want. all right, sure. So take distinct P1 and P2, then there is no isomorphism between the corresponding algebras. Not even if I, not only is there no isometric isomorphism, there isn't even a not necessarily isometric isomorphism. And in fact, things are even stronger. Uh, you can't represent the algebra for P1 on little lp2 continuously. Um, well, in fact, the other algebra OD to P2 is isometrically isomorphic to a closed subalgebra of the bounded operators on L of little lp2. So I'm going to describe the proof, and I'll actually say uh, uh, something about it. Uh, I'll change notation a bit to get rid of some indices. Uh, so I'll simply take P and R to be distinct. Uh, D is anything. Then there is no non-zero continuous holomorphism from, and again, it should be uh, uh, ODP there. Wanted to get rid of the indices, then I didn't actually do that. There's no non-zero continuous homomorphism to the bounded operators on LR. So here's how you do it. I've put the relations back. Now I'm going to take linear combinations of generators. Well, I'm going to represent OGP on little LP. I'm going to take now uh, these other things made from the generators. Um, so what are these? You can check they are spatial isometries. The, these are spatial isometries. The reverses are the Ws. They have orthogonal ranges. And the point is that there are infinitely many of them. The ranges don't have to add up to the whole space. In fact, they won't. Um, but there are now disjoint subsets um, of, since it's acting on the integers, there's subsets of integers, such that Vn is an isometric isomorphism from Lp of z to Lp of En, with Wn going backwards. And I'll let the corresponding item potent, which is, is B, which is multiplication by characteristic function of capital En, I'll call that little En. Okay, so now for a sequence well, for the moment, with all but finally many entries equal to zero of just uh, complex numbers, I'm going to simply take the corresponding linear combination of the things Vn. I'm going to call that V of beta. Now I'm going to compute the norm. So I take C there. I, the Vn is isometric. So what do we get? We take the P norm of V of beta C raised to the pth power, it's the sum of the beta n times the norm of the sum of uh, beta n times vn of c. But those vn of c are on disjoint pieces of the underlying measure space. So I just get the sum of the pth powers of the norms of the pieces. vn c has the same norm as c, so I get norm of beta n, absolute beta n times norm C, add it up, and that's just the, the P norm of the sequence beta. Okay, but now I can take beta to be anything in LP and get the same relation. Now I'm going to do the same trick, uh, technically slightly different, um, with the Ws and with now gamma in LQ. So here at the top, I've reproduced what we already did. Take Q to be the conjugate exponent. Gamma is in LQ for the moment with all but finally many of the entries equal to zero. Take the corresponding linear combination of the Ws. Then we'll compute the norm of what W gamma does to Xi. Um, so the, when I take these, these item points, these, are, these live on disjoint pieces of the underlying measure space. So this, you get a sequence of norms, which is an LP, 
uh, if you got the whole space, its LP norm would be all of uh, the norm, the P norm C, it might be smaller because I didn't use all of Z. The norms of the Ws of things are the same as the norms of the Es of things. So I can put W and C in that position instead. And now we do this computation, the norm of W of gamma applied to C. Uh, well, I just put in the formula for it. Uh, and now, um, right, this is the sum of norms. It's less than or equal to the sum of norms of things. And I'm going to use Hilder's inequality here. So I get norm gamma, the Q norm of gamma times the P norm of the sequence of norms. Uh, but that's less than or equal to norm C, the P norm of C. So in fact, W of gamma makes sense for all gamma in LQ and has a norm at least the Q norm, at most the Q norm of gamma. It's actually equal as it turns out. But. Okay, here's what I did so far. Now I'm gonna let the scalar product notation be the usual pairing. Using the relations of the Vs and Ws, you can check that W of gamma times V of beta is the pairing of beta and gamma multiplied by the identity operator. First do it in finite, you have finite support and then in general. So now I'm going to take any homomorphism to a non-zero continuous homomorphism to a non-zero Banach, sorry, non-zero continuous homomorphism to a Banach space. Uh, I didn't even assume it's years old, but uh, I'll take a zero of norm one in the uh, in the range of v of one. We define a linear map from LP by taking. Uh, to E by taking phi of V of beta and applying that to eta zero. It's bounded with norm at most norm of phi. And we'll show that S is bounded below. That's what the W is going to do. That will imply that E has a subspace which is isomorphic, but not necessarily isometrically isomorphic to little LP. Well, for lots of choices of E, that can't happen. So you rule out continuous homomorphisms. So here's the computation. I'm given beta. I'm going to choose gamma and LQ, such that the pairing is one and the norm is the, is the inverse of the norm. I guess I should have said beta is not zero. Okay, so then you have these norm estimates. Uh, phi of W of gamma is less than or equal to norm phi times norm gamma. Uh, and I put in norm gamma in it. And then uh, because of the pairing, the product of those two operators on E is one, is well, phi of one. So eta zero is phi of W of gamma, phi of V of beta, eta zero, which is phi of W of gamma time applied to S of beta. Take norms, one is less than or equal to norm phi, one over norm beta times norm s of beta. So norm s of beta is bigger than or equal to norm phi inverse times norm beta, which is what we wanted. Okay, so here's the conclusion. You have a closed subspace of E, which is isomorphic, to LP of Z, Z bigger than zero, sorry. And if E is LR when R is not equal to P, can't do it. So there's no non-zero continuous homomorphism, even from the Kuntz algebra to L bound operators in LP of the wrong space, and in particular to the wrong, to the Kuntz algebra with the wrong value of P. Now I've just got a couple of comments here. Uh, where the method came from, which I will skip over. It was inspired by something in the c strand algebra, but which was used for very different purposes. And I want to say this method can be greatly generalized uh, and do various other things with it. 
And that is the intended end Okay. And there is another picture. Thank you very much, Chris. Sorry, she went slightly over time, but. I uh, know that, that's good, okay. Um, are there any questions or comments? Where is the picture, Chris? Uh, that's at, uh, what's it called? Uh, Bernie Falls, which is in Northeastern California. Ah. All right. Good to see you, David. David is here. Yeah, so there was a question. Um, um, uh, uh, so, uh, which, which I, I, there were some misprints in the question, so it, was, it wasn't there were typos. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, I'm not sure if it's formulated. Yes, you, you dealt with the uh, one-sided case also. So in a way, you answered my question. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Wonderful talk. Wonderful talk. Every okay, detail you. you gave. <laughs> yes. I have thank a question. Uh, yes. uh, one thing I would like to ask, you know, the space L2 sits in the James space. So uh, that could give an example of the theorem that you just gave. Like you said, uh, LP operator, OPD cannot sit in uh, operator algebra of LR, but uh, operator uh, OP uh, for P equal to two, it can sit in operator algebra of James space because there a copy of L2 sits in uh, uh, James space. Uh, th th this is possible, but you have to be a little bit careful because you, you have to, um, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to be careful with the requirement that things actually be unital and so on. Oh, yes, but, yes, okay. Uh -huh. There will be other so conditions. So I don't know exactly what happens. Uh, fine. There, um, but there, will, there may be other conditions, but at least uh, unexpectedly copy sits, you know, that is what I want. Yes, I, I suspect that I've not looked at this at all, but I suspect there are unexpected copies if you go to things like, uh, uh, what should, should it be, um, Orlich sequence spaces. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Okay. Thank you. Nice Alejandro. to see you after many years. Uh, yeah, Alejandro, you can go ahead. So in sister algebra theory, sometimes the right uh, point of view is to look at the operator space structure. So do you envision something like that also happening here? Yes. Um, I didn't need it for anything which I described so far. Um, it's used to some extent uh, in the uh, what we did on spatial LPAF algebras, uh, although formally one can get rid of it. And in fact, in the paper, we wrote a certain amount about operator uh, space structure and the referee complained about it. <laughs> So that part ended up, uh, much of it ended up disappearing from the paper. Uh, but, but yes, I think that one should be looking at matrix normed LP operator algebras and completely bounded um, and completely contractive, completely isometric and so on for some purposes. Um, certainly for the spatial LPAF situation, uh, the, the statement the classification works for isometric isomorphism, for completely isometric isomorphism. Um, th these come out to be the same. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any others? All right, if not, uh, thanks again, Chris, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, okay, thank you. I